Welcome to the Solar Clips video series covering the basics of solar photovoltaics or solar PV. My name is Drew Chavon and I'm an extension specialist with the University of Maryland. In previous videos we considered several ways to assess the energy requirements to run electrical loads and how to assess the amount of sunlight that's available on a site. Now in today's video we'll learn how to size a solar electric system based on these factors. And while we can't cover every factor that should be considered in designing a system, this video will at least help us to get a ballpark figure on the system size. This will include the number of solar panels that you'll need as well as the inverter size uh, if you're working with AC power. Now to calculate the size of a solar array it's important to understand how much solar energy your site receives as well as how much electricity you plan on generating. And it's easy to compare the solar energy that's shining on your site to the energy that's needed to run your various electrical loads because both forms of energy are measured in watt hours, WH, or kilowatt hours, KWH. And so we'll revisit some of these factors as we consider the math that's involved in sizing a solar array. So first we'll consider our electrical load. You may want to review the previous video where we assessed electrical loads. If you recall, we created an inventory of all of the electrical loads and added up their energy use. We also determined our total energy consumption over a 12-month period using a billing statement from an electric utility provider. In our example, the billing statement reported annual electrical use as 5,592 kilowatt hours, or kWh. For systems intended for seasonal use, you may only need to reference a portion of your annual electric history. Next, we'll multiply this energy value by the percentage of power that we plan to generate. Multiplying by a factor of 1, would represent 100% of the energy coming from solar. But systems providing 100% of the energy can often be large and expensive depending on specific system location and energy factors. So for this example, we'll use a factor of 0.5 instead. This indicates that we're planning to offset 50% of our total energy use by solar. Multiplying the energy in kWh by this 0.5 factor results in 2,796 kilowatt hours to be supplied by our solar electric system. Now, we'll divide this revised energy value by a D-rate factor that accounts for the efficiency of the entire electric system. D-rate factors are based on any losses that you might have on system production from a voltage drop within the DC or AC wiring or any shading that you might have on the panels, or even from dust or bird droppings that might block the sunlight. To account for these losses, we'll use a D-rate factor of 0.77 in accordance with other models like those used by the National Renewable Energy Lab. Dividing by this D-rate factor of 0.77 will help us account for system losses with the resulting value of 3,631 kWh, which is the energy needed to provide 50% of our electrical needs. Now, it's also important to understand how much solar energy your site receives because a solar panel converts solar energy into electricity. And we'll use peak sun hours to express the amount of sunlight that our solar panels will receive. In a previous video, we saw how to easily evaluate peak sun hours from an irradiation map as well as other resources, including NREL's Solar Radiation Data Manual, NASA's uh, Power Data Access Viewer, and the EPA's Enviro Atlas. For this example, we'll use 4.33 kilowatt hours per square meter per day, which is the solar irradiance that would be available to a solar collector here at our Research and Education Center in Keatesville, Maryland, assuming the tilt angle of the solar panel is the same as our latitude, which is 39 and a half degrees. And since peak solar radiation is defined as 1000 watts per square meter, we can simply say that our site here in Keatesville, Maryland receives 4.33 hours per day of peak sun. Now we'll multiply this by 365 days to determine the annual peak sun hours. In this case, we can expect 1,580 hours per year of peak sun. Otherwise, for seasonal or off-grid calculations, you may want to use the lowest possible value of your solar irradiance uh, and account only for the period of time that you anticipate using the system and that will help you compensate for the worst case conditions that you might expect in terms of sunlight availability at different times of the year. In any sense, we'll divide the energy value that we need to generate from the solar electric system by the peak sun hours per year. In this case, we divide 3,631 kilowatt hours by 1,580 hours to obtain 
2.29755 kilowatts or 2,297.55 watts. So this tells us that we need about 2.30 kilowatts or 2,300 watts of system power. And after selecting a solar panel, you can then determine how many of them you'll need in order to provide that power. Assuming I were to select a 200 watt solar panel, I would simply divide 2300 watts uh, of required power by the 200 watts for the solar panel. In this case, we would need 11 and a half panels to provide that power. But obviously you can't just use half of a solar panel. So you could either round down to 11 panels, which would probably provide a little less energy than you anticipated, or you could round up to 12 panels, which would provide a bit more energy than you anticipated. Now we'll consider how to size an inverter for the system. Inverters receive the direct current coming from the solar panels and turns that current into the alternating current that's used by most electrical appliances. Inverters are typically sized based on the size of the solar array that they're connected to. So we can start by looking at inverters that are rated around the 2300 watts for our system. Uh, and we'll need to consider the voltage of the system as well. Typically, when you look at an inverter, it's specified to work within a certain voltage range. So the goal is to design a system where the DC voltage that's produced by the solar array remains within the voltage range that's specified for the inverter. A voltage that's too low can cause the inverter to shut down, uh, while a voltage that exceeds that maximum rating of, of the inverter can cause the inverter to go offline or possibly damage the inverter. Now, in considering the voltage coming from a solar array, it's important to account for temperature-induced effects. This is because the voltage of a solar panel changes based on the temperature. High temperatures will decrease the voltage of a solar panel as the solar panels become less efficient in hot weather. Low temperatures, on the other hand, when it's cold outside, will increase the voltage since solar panels become more efficient in colder temperatures. While solar panels are rated at the standard test conditions of 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius, you'll need to account for the higher and lower temperatures that your solar panels will actually be exposed to. For this example, I'll reference the historical high and low temperatures in my area using the Plant Maps website. You can find a link in the description below. In this case, I'll reference Hagerstown, Maryland, which is near our research and education center here in Keatesville. The historical low is reported as negative 16 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 27 degrees Celsius, and that occurred way back in 1994. The historical high temperature is reported as 107 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 42 degrees Celsius, and that again occurred in 1999. Now, it's not likely that these temperatures will be seen again anytime soon, but we'll use these as extreme conditions in this example as conservative values which could impact our system performance. And we'll use this temperature range negative 27 degrees Celsius to positive 42 degrees Celsius to calculate the highest and the lowest voltages that we might generate with our solar array. We'll start by evaluating the maximum possible voltage which again occurs at the lowest temperature. In this case we'll reference the open circuit voltage, VOC, that's found on the data label for the solar panel. The open circuit voltage for this panel is 27 volts. This is the highest voltage that you'll get from this panel under the standard test conditions of 25 degrees Celsius. And we also need to reference the temperature coefficient of the open circuit voltage. The value of this coefficient may be found on the back of the solar panel or can typically be found in the owner's manual. The coefficient for this particular solar panel is negative 0.29% per degree Celsius. Now we can use these two values, the VOC and the coefficient of VOC, to calculate the maximum voltage that would be generated on the coldest day. First, we'll determine the temperature difference between our historic low of negative 27 degrees Celsius and the standard test conditions of 25 degrees Celsius paying careful attention to the negative sign for our historic low. In this case, the difference between these two temperatures is negative 52 degrees Celsius. We need to multiply this temperature difference by the panel's temperature coefficient, but we can't use the temperature coefficient as a percentage, so we'll need to first divide it by 100. This gives us a very small coefficient with a value of negative 
0.0029. So in this case, negative 52 degrees Celsius times negative 0.0029 equals 0.15. So we can expect our actual voltage to increase by about 15% at this very cold temperature. But to see the actual voltage, we would multiply the voltage of the panel, 27 volts, by 1.15, representing a voltage that is 115% of the value given for standard test conditions. So in this case, we would expect to have 31.1 volts coming from the solar panel. Now we'll evaluate the minimum possible voltage, which occurs at the highest temperature. In this case, we'll reference the optimum operating voltage, VMP, that's found on the panel's data label. In this case, the optimum operating voltage is listed as 22.6 volts. This is the lowest voltage that you'll get from the panel under standard test condition. And this time, we need to reference the temperature coefficient of the maximum power, or Pmax. So looking at the owner's manual once again, this coefficient is negative 0.37% per degree Celsius. Now, using these two values, the VMP and the coefficient of Pmax, we can calculate the minimum voltage that would be generated on the hottest day. Following a similar procedure, we'll determine the temperature difference between our historic high of 42 degrees Celsius and the standard test conditions of 25 degrees Celsius. In this case, the temperature difference is 17 degrees Celsius. We may also choose to include a temperature correction factor based on the type of installation. In this case, we'll add a temperature correction factor of 35 degrees Celsius for a roof-mounted system. Roof-mounted systems are typically hotter because they don't have much air circulation between the panel and the roof. In any case, adding this temperature correction gives us 52 degrees Celsius. We then need to multiply this temperature by the panel's temperature coefficient. But again, the coefficient must first be divided by 100. This gives us a very small coefficient again with a value of negative 0.0037. So in any case, 52 degrees Celsius times negative 0.0037 equals negative 0.19. So we can expect our actual voltage to decrease by about 19% when the temperature is so hot out. So in other words, our solar panel would only produce about 81% of its voltage. So we can multiply the voltage of the panel, 22.6 volts, by 0.81, representing a voltage that's only 81%. And in this case, we could expect to have 18.25 volts coming from the solar panel. Now we need to make sure that the voltage coming from our whole solar array never falls outside of the voltage range that's specified by the inverter. As an example, we'll select an inverter that has a DC input voltage window between 125 volts and 300 volts. Now we can divide the lower threshold of the inverter by the lowest possible voltage coming from a solar panel. In this case, 125 volts divided by 18.25 volts equals 6.8 modules. But we can safely round up to seven modules. Now, we'll divide the higher threshold of the inverter by the maximum possible voltage coming from a solar panel. In this case, 300 volts divided by 31.1 volts equals 9.6 modules. But we'll round down to nine modules so that we don't exceed the inverter's threshold. So in this case, a string of seven, eight, or nine of these solar modules can be connected in series without going outside the inverter's range. Any less and the inverter may shut down without having the sufficient voltage. Any more and the voltage may damage the inverter. As you can see, sizing a solar electric system can become quite complex with the system design being impacted by many additional factors including what your goals are as well as what your budget is and also any local regulations that you might have in your area. With that said, I hope this video has provided you with a basic understanding of how to size and design your solar electric system. You can subscribe to this channel to stay connected on upcoming episodes of this Solar Eclipse video series, but in the meantime, please visit our website for more information on solar, photovoltaics, and other energy-related topics.